Now I'm a worm guy, but there's a worm that absolutely sucks. We'll get to that on today's video. My name is Steve Churchill, and this is the Urban Worm Company. In 2012, my wife told me she wanted a compost pile in our backyard. Being the dutiful husband I am, I obliged and gathered all of our leaves from the prior fall, went to a local convenience store to gather as many coffee grounds as I possibly could. I mixed everything together, I watered down the pile, and I was thrilled to see it rise to 150 degrees within a couple days. I thought it was cool, but like a lot of composters, especially a lot of new composters, my fascination gave way to other things, and I forgot about that decomposing pile behind my barn. But after the pile cooled and we got towards late summer, I went to inspect the pile, which had been greatly reduced in volume. I ran my pitchfork through it, and I was both amazed and kind of disturbed at the ridiculous amount of worms thrashing around the pile. I also couldn't help but notice that the stuff in the pile was increasingly fragmented and began to look a lot like coffee grounds. Not the same coffee grounds that I put in there, but something, something a little bit different. I went inside and I told my wife about the worms and the coffee grounds, and she told me that what I was looking at was something called worm castings. From there, my curiosity about worms and the reason for starting the urban worm company was born. But what I quickly learned was that these worms were not the good guys we're used to. They're a harmful, invasive species of earthworms commonly referred to as Asian jumping worms. I started researching these guys in about 2014, and the earliest reference to them I could find came from the Departments of Natural Resources in Wisconsin and Vermont. Pretty soon after reading that material, I was really convinced that these worms are not good guys. Now, I think it's really important to make a distinction between non-native species and invasive species. Non-native species, as the name suggests, do not occur naturally in a given ecosystem. They were put there by man either intentionally or accidentally. But non-native species have either a neutral or maybe even a positive effect on the environment. But invasive species are a subset of non-native species that have a negative effect on the environment. They may be predators for native animals and their existence has a generally negative effect. So while most earthworms, including the most common composting worm species like the red wiggler, are non-native, they are not considered invasive. But Asian jumping worms are non-native and invasive. Hey, real fast, I get it. This is kind of a depressing topic, but I'm committed to making this channel a go-to resource for worm composting information. So if you find this video helpful, please like it, subscribe to this channel, and hit that little bell to notify you anytime we come out with a new video. All right, back to the topic. These worms are a huge concern from the upper Midwest to the Northeast and then down the Eastern seaboard of the US. But why are we freaking out about an earthworm? Well, these worms are voracious eaters of organic matter. That doesn't make them unique. What makes these guys different is that they proliferate in forests and they consume the organic matter on the forest floor at an alarming rate. You see, the leaves that fall from our trees provide food for the forest and years beyond. They also provide a protective canopy for the forest life underneath them. When this canopy gets eaten so quickly by the Asian jumping worm, it destroys the natural habitat for forest critters like soil invertebrates, salamanders, and non-invasive earthworms. As worm composters, we're conditioned to think that worm castings are just a good thing. But forests infested with Asian jumping worms have unbalanced soil chemistry and bare unprotected areas where the leaf litter was consumed far too quickly. Thankfully, the invasive Asian jumping worm is super easy to identify, and it has a lot of telltale signs. First, its clitellum, which is that fleshy band that wraps around an earthworm, is a milky white color and is flush with the body of the worm. This is very much unlike the raised pink clitellum that wraps around an adult red wiggler, which you're probably very familiar with. Second, it moves in a very snake-like manner. I'm not a snake guy at all, and handling these worms gives me the heebie-jeebies. With maybe the exception of the Indian blue, the most common composting worms that you're familiar with are pretty sluggish. Not so with these guys. They are very active and fast moving. Third, in certain light, these worms will have an iridescent sheen on their skin, and you're going to see different colors on them in different light. They can even look metallic at times. Fourth, Asian jumping worms will thrash so hard in your hands that their tails will literally fall off. Yes, they will tear themselves apart trying to escape you. Also, unlike the composting worms you're familiar with, Asian jumping worms are an annual species, and they die off every winter. That sounds like a good thing, but very much like composting worms, the cocoons from Asian jumping worms will survive the winter freeze and will remain basically cryogenically frozen like Han Solo in The Empire Strikes Back until temperatures rise to over 50 degrees and stay there for a few days. So the worms from the previous year will die, but the cocoons persist and hatch all at once after the spring thaw. To make matters worse, the cocoons from Asian jumping worms are dark colored, unlike the yellowish colored composting worm cocoons, and they're very difficult to distinguish from the dark organic matter where they reside. So the worms themselves are easy to identify, but the cocoons aren't. 
So what can we do? Unfortunately, we don't have any good way to eradicate these guys yet, but we can first commit to not trying to culture them in the first place or use them in our worm bins. Depending on your state's regulations, it may even be illegal to grow Asian jumpers on purpose. I'll go ahead and admit right now that I tried to do worm composting with these before I realized that they were invasive. It just didn't work for some reason, which is kind of a good thing. Second, if you do find jumpers, you'll often find them in piles of compost, wood chips, leaf piles, kind of other woody materials. If you want to kill them, you can take them, put them in a clear plastic bag and let them bake under the sun. Third, make sure to only buy compost from reputable sellers. I personally don't think that you would find Asian jumpers or their cocoons in store-bought compost, mainly because that compost has been sitting in these bags, kind of starved off from oxygen for quite a while. But if you're sourcing compost locally, make sure that your source adheres to standard composting practices, like ensuring their piles reach 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three days or more, and are turned at least three times. Jumpers will not survive those kinds of temperatures and conditions. This story doesn't have a happy ending yet, but state forest and wildlife researchers are having some limited success treating infested areas with diatomaceous earth and biochar to help stop the spread. But the first step we can take now is to know how to identify Asian jumping worms so we can at the very least not unknowingly help spread them in our local environments. That's it for now, guys. We'll get to a less depressing topic on the next video.